Okay. Right. Um, good afternoon. I'm going to say a little bit about the experiment that we, are do we were doing in marine tech facility in Trondheim in Norway. And we'll be looking into nonlinear wave interaction in relation to rock waves. And we heard a little bit about rock waves already this morning. Um, but nevertheless, I'll just say a little bit about motivation and aims, a bit about experimental methodology, some statistical analysis that we've done so far, and spectral evolution that we looked at it, and some further work that we still need to do with that project. I think it's important to say that this project actually involved a number of scientists from different continents, but also from different backgrounds. So we have oceanographers, engineers, and physicists and all looking slightly different aspects. And hopefully we can put the puzzles into jigsaw together at the end. So we heard about the rock waves, those kind of waves which are quite often a single steep waves of very large crest that causes problems to ships like here. But also we're getting a little bit more um, kind of concern about them with having all those offshore wind farms now moving out into deeper sea. And there's been a lot of work done in the last 20 years. There's a lot of knowledge about those waves. And we can talk about kind of a different theories and mechanisms that uh, are behind the formation of those waves, like linear ones, but also spatial focusing, dispersive focusing, nonlinear focusing, all mentioned this morning. So far, I think the most scientists think that nonlinear wave interactions are likely that causes a collector mechanism for generation of those rock waves into the ocean. And also, in most of cases, that really happens when we have narrow banded sea states, meaning that you know, uh, uh, um, very narrow frequency uh, band or directional spread. Now, it doesn't answer all questions about all kinds of waves that we have out there. And for example, a few years ago, there was observation of rock waves forming into the sea, which are interacting together. So something like if you have a cyclone, low pressure moving in, on the back of that, you have a swell coming in, and you have a local waves forming, and interaction of those, which could be from different directions, for example, lead to freak waves. So we still have a little bit more work to do on those kind of bi-directional, multi-directional waves, how they interact, and how those kind of perhaps nonlinear instability in those waves um, lead to rock waves. So this is kind of interest that we are looking at. And we have also interest from the physicists who are in Lancaster, who, you, who did experiments in superfluid helium, looking at the formation of waves there, uh, rock waves there, by um, indicating that the inverse energy cascade is possible mechanism. So what does it mean is actually that we have a downshift of energy from the main frequency or main carrier into lower frequencies. That's what they call in, in inverse energy cascade. This is just example of some waves. So for us, really, the aim was to isolate or really identify the mechanism that l lead to those rock waves in a slightly more um, condition, more realistic conditions. Although we can't talk about this because we are in in the way. So we had a series of tests that are really very much of interest for our colleagues. They're looking to processes which are analog to those that are looking in, in helium. And also number of tests which kind of build from that basic to more complexes to look at the wave dynamics and statistical properties of the waves. And then here, what we are talking today, we look at a little bit of statistical properties of the waves we created and measured, especially in relation to kurtosis, and especially in case of bidirectional seas. So the experiment was conducted in marine ocean basins that we heard about today. And so it's a really large basin, but not large enough for creating some of those mechanisms. So we talk about 70 by 50 meters basin. It could be down to 10 meters depth with a movable um, bottom, but we use a three meter depth for our experiments. 
So there are two sets of wave makers. On the shorter side, we have just the flat maker, which kind of creates irregular, regular waves. And then a multi-flap here on the longer side with 144 different flaps that creates multi-directional seas and irregular and regular waves. So because we have all, and on the opposite side of that maker, there is absorbent uh, a beach. Now, we have also possibly some reflections from the side, so we kind of didn't use nine paddles on this side, and all our kind of main measurements were taken slightly off the center. And we had 24 uh, twin wire wave gauges spaced every five meters. In addition to that, we have three locations where we had the spatial arrays, and those arrays were used then to derive the directions of the waves that we measured. Okay, so what we used for the for regular waves, um, we had a combination of different frequencies, so we can look at the resonant interactions, and we look at also changing crossing angles between those components, so they are very similar, which we used in multidirectional waves, so kind of building up from very small, simple cases up to more complex. Peak period was one second, but that remained the same for all cases, and so we have bi-directional seas, two different sea states. We use two different John swap spectra for frequency distribution, gamma 3 and gamma 6. So one was more broad and gamma 6 would be more narrow. And then we use di different directional spread from 50, which is about 20 degrees, which is quite normal out in the sea. And then the narrow banded, about 200, 840, that's kind of gives you directional spread about 7 or so degrees. It's quite narrow. And here we have different directions, different crossings from zero, which is actually just kind of multiplying the same case, to 10, 20, 30, and 40 degrees. So if we just kind of concentrate here to, um, in this uh, talk about irregular test, so if you look at here, so we have component one, as I said, gamma three, a different um, different uh, um, has very narrow band and different beta. So all of that kind of gave, give us a steepness of about 0.12 to 0.16 and BFI, which is Benjamin Fear Index, about 0.7 to 1.1, that's kind of ratio of the steepness and spectral bandwidth. And if you, you know, have higher ones, so you have more nonlinearities, more steeper waves, more likely to get to rogue waves. So let's look at some of the results from those irregular tests. And so first we look at the exceedance probability of wave crests, so a different location uh, across the, the basin. So this is about three wavelengths. This is about 16 and 20 wavelengths from, from the uh, puddles. With those crosses, our measurements, and with the uh, black line, Israeli distribution, and and with the red one is typhoon or uh, distribution which is based on second order theory. And we'll look at here um, deviations, the unidirectional case. So this is just kind of almost like unidirectional because it's zero between two waves, but it's just much steeper. And then we have 20, 40 degrees difference. Then we have a narrow banded spectra interacting together here. And then here we have actually some waves which I forgot to say, but hopefully we'll say later, which have also not just directional, uh, different directions, but different uh, peak frequencies as well. I'll talk a bit later about that. So what we see here, that deviation is increasing as we go along the channel, so farther from, from the puddles. And also that that kind of increases with, with uh, um, the uh, narrow uh, band, or um, if you have um, unidirectional waves or narrow directional spread, that's much larger deviation. Now, the steep crest doesn't necessarily mean that the wave height doesn't um, follow daily distribution, and we see that nicely case here. Um, so here the wave height um, exceedance probability is plotted against Rayleigh, 
um, probability, and we see that most of cases they match very well, so it's very well defined, except in few cases, again, unidirectional seas, and then those really two narrow spectra interacting, and especially farther away you go from, from, the, from the pebbles. And especially in the tail, so we talk about the highest waves in the, in the series. So the one of the definitions of uh, rock waves or freak waves is that their wave, the maximum wave height is twice of significant wave height. And if you look at the maximum wave height uh, measured for different cases here along the, the, um, the basin, so we have in blue unidirectional case, and those are multidirectional case with different uh, crossing in red and green, and then uh, with different frequencies in black and in red, different spreading, narrow spreading. So you see that in all cases, actually, we managed to see some freak waves. Most of them actually unidirectional. That's kind of already found before. Um, and the other kind of things here is that we follow really nicely that, you know, they are in multidirectional cases, they are coming towards the end of the basin, so further away from, from uh, the puddles, which is also theoretically, you know, that takes some time to develop those. Kurtosis is a statistical property which is very often used for indication of nonlinearities and indication of um, presence of the rogue waves. And what we plotted here is kurtosis of those uh, waves that we measured. And for a Gaussian C state, the kurtosis value is 3. If we, in, if we use the second order theory and uh, the presence of bound waves, the expression for kurtosis in those cases gives us 3.2. and Higher kurtosis means we probably have more free waves and nonlinear interaction between those free waves. So we see here unidirectional case jumps up, the kurtosis is really high, and in those, those multidirectional waves, mostly we are down in the kind of bound second order theory, except in case of very narrow spectra, directional spectra interacting together, we started to move up and have some free waves. <clears throat> Mori and Rato, um, sorry, Mori and Janssen did um, develop exceedance of probability of rock waves and that's kind of based on the value of choices and the value of the number of waves in the record. And they tested that theory by, uh, measure, uh, by using the measured waves out in the sea. But because you have quite a um, quite limited number of waves in those records, what they could find is that there is a correlation between maximum wave height and kurtosis, but they didn't really find a distinctive difference for a different number of waves. So here, having here more waves measured in the lab, we look at the correlation between um, ratio of H max over significant wave height, and this means that we are ensemble averaging here, over kurtosis plotted here in different color for different number of waves. So we look at the whole set of 4,800 waves down to smaller set of 200 waves. Well, we see that you know there is a correlation definitely between kurtosis and those maximum waves, but also we have a different lines here for different number of waves. So we see that actually the number of waves in the record could influence um, that relationship. The other things what we see here, the two different parts, is that here we have multidirectional waves down here, and here we have unidirectional waves. So this kind of brings us to a slightly different thing. So um, one minute. Right. OK. In 2011, Mario Narato and Janssen actually developed the expression for kurtosis, taking into account now not just the uh, wave steepness and uh, frequency bandwidth, but also directional bandwidth in something what is called effective Benjamin Fear Index. And so we plotted here now is that expression in blue and including bound waves in those kind of dashed lines. Our data 
in um, dots and versus directional spread. Now, see we have two different sets here. Everybody who did experiments in the lab or in field, for that matter, and trying to look at directions and directional spread came to the problem of defining that. Very often you find that directional spread is much wider than usually is because of the methods that we use. And the problem here is when you have the bispectra, bimodal Cs, is that you, know, you start to have much larger spread. So how you do it, you can look at the whole one, as we look at here with the full dots, or you can look at each part, each component here, and then sum it, and it's in white one. And so you see the slightly difference, but we are again somewhere between the one which the expression um, the original expression, expression which takes bound waves. Okay, so I'm going to finish. There's a little bit more work that Jamie, the student here, is doing on looking really the spectral shape, which is very important. We are de detecting the downshift. And the downshift happening not just to higher, uh, to lower energies, like this kind of inverse cascade, but also to higher energy, which really does depend on the directional um, spread of our wave state. Also very important how, if you have bimodal frequency states, how close those frequencies are, where the energy shifts, um, going to lower frequencies or higher frequencies. And this is something, as I said, that um, Jamie is working for his PhD. Okay? Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Right. I thought if you don't, I could show you some more, more pictures. <laughs> okay. Yeah, please do. We have uh, still three more minutes. Okay. Yeah. So my, my question is, can, can, can you go back to the um, uh, wave height or, or, or the kurtosis uh, which was measured? Yeah. So, so it seems that the kurtosis was, was or, and the wave height were... You want this one or...? Uh, no, before, uh, some slides before. This one. Even before? Yeah, that's one. Okay. So, so it seems that the kurtosis is, is growing, but or also the way I did, it was growing a little bit. It's a little bit of trend, yeah. So, so do you expect that it will saturate at some point, or so it's just due to an initial condition that you're put in? Right, as you, as you said this morning as well, I mean that to come to the same level of, of, you know, like saturation, I think you need to have a little bit longer, longer basin, so we are actually running a little bit out, however this kind of is long one. Um, but I don't think that this is going to develop much farther than that, looking into some of the work that's done before. What's happening is that when, you know, larger spread you have, less chances you have that, and that, you know, you have a steep, steep wave, so you start to disperse them. So, overall, you might have uh, rogue waves, but the probability will be much lower than it would be in those very... Uh, narrow banded um, cases. So far, I think so. But there are cases that might happen, but very, very low probability. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, high fluctuations, well, Curtis is not very sensitive to, to isolated waves. It's, uh, you, you could use PDF for higher moments, uh, which is more sensitive to real uh, isolated uh, waves. What do you mean with PDF? So probably the probability distribution, distribution function uh, of yeah. uh, amplitude. Uh. Yes, that's what we've done, but I haven't shown here. Yeah, yeah. You, you see then really, again, very much deviation. So with surface elevation, you see quite a bit of deviation, especially in crests. That's why we showed the crests here. Hmm. Okay? Because you have a very asymmetrical shape. You start to have higher crests and, and lower troughs. Yes. Here, as I say, Curtis is not very sensitive to isolated waves. Okay. 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 Well, we can discuss a bit later. Yes. Okay. okay. I think uh, we have to stop here. Uh, thank you again. Okay. And we will have another coffee break now, and uh, in half an hour.